Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Horaces Global Meeting 2022. And uh, it's a pleasure having you here on this very, very important panel on Africa. Uh, we have been able to assemble a fantastic panel to deep dive on the issues currently um, affecting the African continent and definitely concerning issues affecting Africa's competitiveness amongst the global committee of Asia. As you are aware, Horasis is an international think tank headquartered in Zurich that annually brings together chairmen, CEOs of some of the largest companies of the world, heads of government, the academia, and the Bell laureates, and, and to name a few, to discuss critical issues shaping the globe. This year, we'll be deep diving into uh, a lot of issues affecting the world, as it may seem right now, the Russia and Ukraine crisis going on uh, as we speak. Uh, its effect on international trade, its effect on the global economy, as it were. Uh, the, this meeting is going to be totally and in depth discussing the issues that will be emanating from these um, affectionate factors. But most importantly, we'll be talking about, on this panel, we'll be talking about Africa's search, Africa's movement towards success, Africa's movement towards more competitiveness, more growth, more productivity. And to discuss this panel, we have um, uh, a very rich, rich, a very rich um, access to the quality of resources we have within the Horaces platform. And um, I'll be giving the, I'll be yielding the mic right now to Andre Bogdanov to briefly introduce himself, what he does, and his general introductory remarks to set the ball rolling. Over to you, Andre. Yeah, my name indeed. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, the, my name indeed is uh, Andre Andre Bogdanov. I am um, principal and interim CEO of uh, Risk and Science. By background, uh, coming from the finance, uh, been years and years and years working for the uh, multinational companies. And then uh, about seven years ago, I started my journey with Risk and Science. And now, as I said, I'm uh, interim CEO of the company. Uh, we headquarters in the, uh, Johannesburg, South Africa, and our core businesses at this stage, we started as the data science uh, team, small. Uh, now we are a mid-sized company. We consider ourselves as a mid-sized company. We are uh, over 20 people as of today. And uh, our core, uh, what we do is uh, ESG, ESG ratings for African, com uh, African uh, companies listed in Africa at African exchanges. Uh, so far, we've done Nigeria, we've done major economies in Kenya, we've done South Africa, and quite a few are in the pipelines to be launched this year. We're using our proprietary uh, tool uh, that's an uh, AI powered uh, ESG uh, rating tool called ESG GPS. Uh, we collected a number of the words, but I'm not going to stop there. It's not marketing pitch in any way or form. Uh, yeah, and to me, uh, why I joined this panel, uh, what I wanted to discuss, and uh, Chair, thank you for picking on those two, two major issues, which is uh, Africa in the context of the global crisis. I don't think anyone would question that we are in crisis mode, and we're in crisis mode for a number of years, and I'm not, uh, I don't want to, uh, to stop now to unbend um, uh, as we go. And I don't think a crisis started today or yesterday, and even if the events in Europe would stop, say, tomorrow or the day after, which is uh, possibility is relatively low, but even if it stops, the crisis will still continue, and it's not even COVID. This crisis started earlier. Uh, that's one. And two, uh, I like what was mentioned also uh, in the initial uh, in the initial few initial few words uh, by Chair, that's the uh, African competitiveness. And I think it's very important to look at the African competitiveness in the in the context of, uh, especially at this panel, in the context of the global competitiveness in South Africa, because very often um, I've been doing the, uh, I've been doing, I've been living as well as working with emerging economies pretty much all my life, uh, with a little exception uh, a few years in Switzerland, living there, but actually working uh, with emerging economies in emerging economies uh, quite across the globe. And uh, the one thing which uh, I definitely picked up, at least from my perspective, is um, very often, uh, and Africa is not exceptional, very often we are playing this catch-up game in the emerging economies, and it will be very interesting to, uh, to go a little bit deeper on that, on that matter. How not to catch up, but rather to, if not lead, then see where the, the world is moving and try to catch up at that station, not where we are today or not where we were yesterday. 
yeah, so that will be my first few words to start with. Chen, blessing. Thank you very much, um, Andre. Over to you, blessing. Your an introduction of yourself and what you do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here again and to be in a pan amazing team, Noel and Andre. Um, my name is Blessing Obehi Ayumere. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Umogini Pipeline Infrastructure Limited. Uh, we operate in the um, midstream of the oil and gas in Nigeria. And my role there is to help um, solve the problem of crude oil evacuation. If you have listened to media recently, you know that Nigeria is challenged with uh, the problem of crude evacuation. Um, crude oil production still remains our major stay as a country. And, um, we are losing so much of that, um, you know, um, production to theft, bunker, and all other things. So we have moved from just running the issue of evacuation as um, an add-on infrastructure to a full-blown solution to the nation's problem. We have started a little bit and we are contributing both in the western and the southern part of the Niger Delta. And we hope to expand that and see how we can solve the problem of community uh, unrest the problem of the social factors and challenges that are there. And of course, the issue of governance also come to play. Um, I also am the chairman of the Independent Ratification Committee for Nigerian Quoted Companies for Risk Insight ESG GPS. I'm happy to be working with Andre um, and a team of intelligent uh, people globally you know, resolving that problem. I must say, seeing Andre here on this panel is quite a huge honor and privilege because he carries a lot of value when it comes to the issue of sustainability and growth. So, Andre, it's a pleasure meeting you here again. Um, so, my focus today is to look at this ACFA we are talking about, how is it working for Africa? Um, it's not the first time people will enact... Um, trade zones as continents or as a group of people with common interests. You know, things that have to do with Africa is always different. Now we have started this journey. The question is, how are we going to implement this? Have we learned from our mistakes? Have we decided to do things differently? Um, what has been the missing link? Laws, rules, regulations have never been our problems. We have them and we have them in sufficient quantity. Um, is there something we are going to bring on board this time to bring the change that we need as a people? I, I think that's my interest in the whole of this. Or are people going to hijack this process? Do we have people behind the scene blowing the whistle and the process is going to be hijacked and we just continue to clap, you know, and being spectators in our own movies? Or we are going to be active players in the realm of acting ourselves? I think those are part of the things uh, that we look at. So the government rule comes here. And of course, the people also, the business enterprise, they also come um, to the fore when it comes to the issue of how we are able to partner together, leverage our you know, experiences, and, and be supportive as we go ahead. Um, that, that will be my introduction for now. Over to you, Noel. Thank you very much, um, Andre. Thank you very much, Blessing. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll kickstart our conversations in the following manner, and we'll start from a leadership perspective. Um, as we all know, as, as you know, uh, frequently stated by you know, leadership expert John Maxwell, he usually says everything rises and falls on leadership. And um, the African mm -hmm. Union is a coming together of 55 heads of government uh, to, to put together the African Continental Free Trade Agreement as a, a, a competitive strategic tool uh, to position Africa uh, amongst the global committee of nations for Africa to be more competitive, to add more value uh, to what, whatever the world is producing. Uh, but the problem everybody seems to 
notice with this arrangement is the leadership vacuum obviously present within the African continent, uh, from Nigeria to Ghana, from Senegal to Zimbabwe to to from Cote d'Ivoire to South Africa. That 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 quest for quality leadership has always been at the forefront of all conversations within the continent. Now, judging from from that perspective, do we think that the African Union as an entity is capable of driving and leading this process of regional competitiveness as put forward through the African Continental Trade Agreement? Uh, I'll, I'll start with you, uh, um, Andre. If I may uh, extend a little bit of the, uh, the borders of the question, because uh, again, in my opinion, the um, uh, what we what we're observing today, yeah, and I'll start it, then I'll come back to uh, to this Africa. But I think it's important to look at the global uh, global context where, where we are today. Yeah, um, if you look at the uh, the latest reports of the well, any pretty much anyone and everyone, but I like always to call it World Economic Forum because um, what is concise is a member of the new champions of the World Economic Forum, so we're associated with the with the organization. Uh, the recent one identifying, uh, and then many of them, again, just one of them, but many of them identifying the three key risks, yeah? And I'm sure we'll be touching on all of them, but uh, in the context of that question, I would like to go with the geopolitical risks. Because if you look at geopolitical risks, besides the shifting of the power, which is happening, some people will say fortunately, some people will say unfortunately, because some of the nations will say that the, uh, to, to live at the time of change is actually bad news for the generation, but we, we, we live with the quiet times, relatively quiet times now, it's uh, big shifts uh, globally happening. I think if we go back to the leadership question, um, as much as those shifts are inevitable and uh, they were uh, predetermined by the, uh, the whole development of the human civilization, uh, the leadership globally is actually very weak, if I may put it straight. Because uh, the conflict which we're noticing today, and I'm not only talking about what's happening in Europe as of today, yeah, or started yesterday, well, literally yesterday, about 70, 78 days ago. I'm talking about the previous conflicts as well. Uh, when the US uh, passed withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, what happened in Iraq, what happened in a number of other countries. The leadership, leadership, and leadership is definitely not there. The leadership more concentrating on the next elections. The leadership is concentrating more on what we can fix today. The leadership more concentrating uh, on what can we do to somehow explain what happened in the past and take maximum advantage out of it personally. And Africa, I don't think Africa is exception, but whether Africa, and I like always look at the risks and opportunities, looking again from the in totality in the global perspectives. Africa, interesting enough, and African Union specifically, has a very interesting role, and that role is even without much of the doing, per se, is becoming bigger and bigger. Is that third or fourth or fifth, and again, I'm not ranking them, I'm just saying that's probably not the key, but one of the key powers in the world. And whether African leaders are prepared for it or not, that's a question on its own which is very interesting to answer, but definitely a role of Africa, if you look at the recent, even in the recent events, yeah, where uh, parties involved in the conflict looking, busy looking for the support from all over the globe, and Africa is not playing the last role in that, interesting enough. All of a sudden, Africa became important again. And that's critical role of Africa to play, and uh, as, much as, uh, as much as there are different comments, and I'm again picking an example, yeah, uh, when President Ramaphosa extended the hand and said, look, I, I can help to broker the deal here as well, yeah? Uh, to me, that was a sign of the, if not, if, if not Africa there yet, but definitely awakening. And that's where I would see the leadership of Africa uh, gaining its, well, it's, it's, it's already given to Africa, if you like, by that shift of power. So it's basically to pick it up and sort it out, I mean, to, 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 to take the, uh, the, the, the step up or uh, step forward and to take that position, which is at the moment the world, to some extent, offering, because we definitely see the crisis on all sides, wherever you look across the globe. And Africa, again, not exception, but Africa never played that important role. And I hope that Africa would not be playing only the role of supporter of somebody. Africa will, 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 will raise the voice in a good way, 
And Africa has a lot to offer to the world because bad news or good news, but uh, African nations, uh, unfortunately, we were, we've been living in, well, fortunately, we've been living in peace for a number of years, but a number of conflicts in African soil were happening. And that's that's very sad lesson, but it's very important lesson at the same time, which we can, well, donate, if you like, or give to the world. And that's how we, 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 we solve those conflicts. So that's that's my, my, my opinion. Whether the African leadership is up for it, Again, the, I'm taking an example of President Ramaphosa who extended his hand. Well, lots of comments, different comments. And uh, I would disagree with many of them, I would agree with some, but uh, it, was, it was definitely the move saying, well, listen, we, we are here, we can, we can always help. We, can, uh, we, 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 we are not just watching. We are not passive player. We can actually step into our shoes and if you want, we can help. And I think that's, that's, that was an important step. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Um, you, you, you touched a lot of issues, and uh, I'd like Lesson to react to that. But before he does, I just want to state that, you know, within, for, to Blessing, within the context of, you know, the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, its impact on Africa attaining the Sustainable Development Goals, and all of that, um, you know, Andre has talked about the weak leadership capacity um, resident within the continent. Uh, he's, he's touching a lot of issues. I want to know what your thoughts are. At the same time, uh, I, I need you to speak to the relationship between that kind of weak leadership experience within the continent and our ability to achieve the ideals uh, set put forward in the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. Thank you so much, Noel, and uh, thanks, Andre, for for that great um, insights and thoughts. Um, I, I will start from where you you I mean the comment you made earlier, Noel, as to quoting John Maxwell, the fact that everything rises and falls on leadership. You know, there have been different debates about that, and people say no, everybody have to be involved, and why I agree that everybody should um, be involved. Um, if we look back to history, we'll realize that for every change that has happened, um, there have always been a leader. The place of leadership is quite critical. The leadership is able to, leadership does not mean you are a superstar, you can do everything by yourself. It's just your ability to harness the resources, okay? Um, that you have and achieve goals. And Africa is so loaded with talents, you know, with Dodan talents everywhere, both within the Africa continent and those that have gone offshore to acquire great skills. And we see how Africans are contributing globally. So when we come back home, the question is the quality of what we see outside is not reflected in our governance, right? So, and the question is, why is it like that? So when we come to the African Union, um, we look at the 54 member nations or the 55 member nations, and we look at those, we, we see bundles of talents. However, when it comes to the issue of implementation of some of these policies, one of the things that I have seen actually is more of um, bringing selfishness and self above the common good, right? Where people want to um, focus on what they can get, um, most likely saving for four or five generations instead of looking at, you know, I mean, selfish generation now for yourself, your family, tribalism, sentiment. You know, there's this saying that if you don't know where you are going, you will probably end up somewhere else, you know? And I think that's a problem with Africa. Um, we talk it, we don't do it. Um, do we know where we are going to? Um, and if we do, what are the practical and tangible steps we are taking to get there? Policies are not our problem. We have got good policies. We have got good um, we talk a lot. Um, I, I think it is time we begin to move out. And this ACFA is a good place to start. 
now that we are having negotiations going on, the negotiation, the phase one negotiation, talking about trade and uh, trade of goods and services, how are we bring that up? Are we going to be sincere when it comes to that implementation? We talk about the phase two of this work. How are we looking at the issue of property rights? You know, are we going to be able to, are we going to be secure in ourselves? You know, are we going to be, to be able to open our hearts as a people to say, you know what, when one succeed, all succeed. I will look at the phase three negotiation when we begin to talk about the e-commerce. And of course, we know that e-commerce have revolutionized the world today. How, how, how sincere are we going to be in doing this? Are we, are we going to be able to say, you know what, let us hold our hands and run. For those that are ahead, we are willing and ready to support the people that are coming behind. You know, but let me backtrack a little bit and say it starts from our choice of leaders, the choice of leaders. And I think it is time for Africans to rise when it comes to the issue of leadership, the selection. Elections are all around the corner from different countries, starting from my country, Nigeria, for example. And what do we see? We, instead of people discussing issues of education, issues of productivity, issue of poverty eradication, and how to be competitive in a global scene. We see politics that are focused on religion, tribalism, sentiment, and that is not taking us anywhere. At the end of the day, who do we put there to lead us? They are people that don't have the capacity. You know, they are not, they don't have the sagacity to be able to break through the global world that we are in or penetrate the, 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 the global uh, economy that we have. The issues are quite tough. And for us to be able to manage what we have, own what we have, and, and be competitive in the Committee of Nations, I think the issue of leadership. And if paradventure we have leaders that go there by chance or by mistake, they have to learn in the process. All right? It is not... It is not a right thing. It's about the, the future of 1.3 billion people that are at stake here. And, and more than 60% of these 1.3 billion people are young people, that the future is key. And that's where the issue of sustainability comes into play. And I'm sure that will be the discussion maybe I'll have later. The issue of sustainability or the ESG focus, you know, how we can bring it down to governance, how we can bring it down to business, how we can bring it down to collaboration. I, I think that will begin to play a key role um, as the SDG um, has also proposed. I, I will stop there for now. Thank you very much, uh, Blessing. That was quite um, insightful. Uh, I, I want us to, you know, take our conversations further, you know, in line with what Professor Michael Porter usually talks about when he tries to describe, you know, the competitiveness of nations and um, he talked about factor condition, uh, firm strategy and um, rivalry amongst firms within a particular industry, or he talks about the role of government or the presence of support industries and, you know, collaborating bodies and all of that. Now, um, Africa is a research is a resource-rich continent, uh, very resource-rich, if I may say. And um, for, to a very large extent, when you talk about the, you know, access to factor conditions for development, Africa is resource-rich. We have oil and gas, we have um, land, we have uh, huge um, water resources and all of that. But we have not added innovation, research and development to those conditions you know, to, to take us to another level. Now, in the, within the context of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, this is something that you know should be at the forefront, at the, at the forefront burner of conversations. Um, within the context of competitiveness, what should African leaders be thinking about? How can Africa position itself uh, competitively amongst other nations? Because when it comes to high technology products, high technology um, services, and all of that, you know, Africa is not a player. What should we be looking at? How can we become a player? How can we add value as far as the world is concerned? I'll start with you, um, Andrew. Um, well, Blessing, thank you. And if I, if I may, just one comment on the, uh, what you just said, because the, uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the weak or with the absence of the leadership, obviously there is a very big uh, 
very big um, issue related to the particular uh, to the emerging economies and African countries are not exception when there is a potential uh, another way where Africa will be moved from one not very bright story I mean which was happening in the early past yeah which is not not long time ago to another one when it will be tiered between those new superpowers yeah superpower would be called it one it most likely would be a few of them but but that's the reason yeah and just one side comment so you're on what he was saying with such a passion and i i, I can't agree more uh to answering your um uh the question where, where africa is i want to go back a little bit and uh, i started this uh, my uh, my few words uh, at the very beginning of the session where i said that africa and uh, overall emerging economies is one of the those traps yeah is to uh, to sort of try to develop something going back, yeah. Uh, what I'm trying to say is uh, industrialization is a very very famous word, and let's industrialize. It's so good because it's uh, lots of people will be building something, will be working at the factories, and uh, we will be mimicking to some extent what some other nations did a few years ago. I think the very important element here is a few years ago. What was good yesterday is definitely not, it's not definitely, sorry, it's not really okay for today as the objective because it will take time to get there. And it's definitely not okay for tomorrow. And that's where the focus of many, unfortunately, is always missed. We like as a human say, oh, that's a great success story. Let's now put it on our land and repeat it. Forget about the, the differences, I mean, culturally, country, climate, and all of that. But just an idea of what was good yesterday would be good today. The time is flying. It's accelerating as we speak. So that's why, to me, when I started with the, uh, the risks which uh, uh, we are all facing globally, yeah, I think very important for, uh, for Africa overall to take into account that first, we are living at the age of the fourth industrial revolution. We are not preparing ourselves. We're just there. We are at the... We are living in digital economy. It's full stop. It's not debate. It's not tomorrow. It's not day after. That, that's what's happened. Yeah. If you look at the risk related to, for example, cyber, huge risk. We are not ready at all. I mean, on the continent. We are lacking the, the, the major, major skills for those tomorrow jobs. Yeah. And we're trying to create today's jobs. That will not bridge the gap. We, as you absolutely correctly said, and I don't have that magic pill. I, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not politician or you know big time economist. I, I'm more technocrat. You know, I can see certain trends. If you look, going back to the uh, blessing a point on sustainability, and if you look at the my favorite subject matter, ESG. Yeah, Africa is a big mining continent. I don't think we will be able to survive without mining. Many people say, well, mining is bad, it's dirty, a um, lot of, lots of, lots of stories, yeah? But I was listening uh, the other day to uh, one of the uh, oil rich countries' uh, ministers, it was the, uh, the interesting meeting, he was presenting. And uh, what he said was a very interesting turning point in my mind, because we are sometimes looking for technology to replace certain things. Instead of tackling the problem, like CO2, for example, if CO2 is an issue, then we need to tackle the issue of CO2. We shouldn't be thinking in those top-level speeches and predetermine our mind that we need to get rid of certain things. We have an issue with CO2, let's deal with this. It's the same here, we have an issue with the dirty methods of extraction or lack of funding to provide cleaner methods. But it doesn't mean that we should shut down completely mining. Yeah, we can, but then we should go back to cave, all of us, all together. Yeah, and that would definitely be not where everybody is planning to be in the next at least until 2030. So what would be critical for Africa, if I go back to your question, is to, when establishing those goals, is to take into account those. And one of the most, in my opinion, one of the most important ones is the critical point related to the ESG. If Africa can show the example, and unfortunately, we see the movement from the numbers which we have, yeah? From our proprietary model, we see those numbers. And Africa is moving. But one, again, back to your uh, point, Chair, there is no leadership. Africa best following Europe, 
and to some extent states, and the states catching up very fast with Europe in terms of the ESNG. Africa needs actually to be one of the leaders. And the reason why, because if we are not leading, we will not be able to project our destiny. Then somebody else again decide for us and say, listen, what you do here, it's a dirty method. It's not great. Socially, you are not okay because of X, Y, Z we impose on you. And that's why your products will be taxable at, I don't know, double, triple, quadruple, whatever it would be. Yeah. And we will be again sort of at the, at the end of that queue. And we, in this case, we not only will be losing competitive advantage, which as you rightly said, we have a lot of natural resources, yeah? But we will be also not losing the foundation to build something for the future. So that's to me the, again, it's, I'm not answering your question again. I'm not the, uh, I, I, you need to do the proper research and then build the proper theories around. But those fundamentals, when the people are thinking about it, unfortunately, it's missed. A lot of them looking across the ocean saying, oh yeah, that country 30, 40, 50 years ago started. Look at where they are now. We should do the same. It will not work. Will not. It will, it will not take us anywhere, unfortunately. So that's, that's my few comments from the very, very, very much technical. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. Uh, Blessing, would you like to chip in something from that perspective? Okay, so um, the, the, yeah, I agree with, with Andre again. And the, the reality is the fact that um, though many of the African nations, and if not all today, have left the issue of um, um, foreign colonization, as it were, politically, we are still being colonized. Um, and as long as we remain in that meta colonization, we are going to be in, continue to play the inferior and the second fiddle role. And as long as we do that, even in this ACFA that we are looking at, um, people are going to come, you know, and still tell us that we don't have the capability and quality, you know? And like Andre say, we are far below in the line. Um, we need to start trusting ourselves. And it starts from the leadership. We see a few of the African nations that have done this and they are stepping up in the ranking ladder, all right? Um, but the issue of continuity is there as a major problem. So you see one leader coming today and they start good policies and we are making progress, and another comes, and they destroy the whole fabric of the structure that we have. Continuity is key if we must make sustainable progress as, as a continent. Um, we need to be disciplined and focus on you know, um, the fact that we have what it takes. We don't really need the approvers from outside to make the progress. They will join us if we start doing the right thing. Uh, the world will join us. We have the resources, we have the people, we have the land, okay? So then what are we looking for outside? So looking inward for me is key um, in this conversation. We need to start looking inwards. We need to start raising businesses. Um, internally that are champions, not monopolistic kind of business where one person arises in, in the sector and, and every other person that comes is killed, you know? Uh, monopoly, we need to start managing that process where we begin to see raising of champion, business champion from sector to sector um, instead of, you know, the issue of um, one man, one big champion have it all. Um, there are so many things we need to learn. And, and some of these things are brought down to the institutional gaps that exist in the system. All right. Um, we can only emerge competitive when we are able to put sound institutions in place. Institutions that will help us mitigate the risk, you know, uh, within us, first of all, and then, then the trust from the community, I mean, the committee of nations in terms of that competition. We're talking about the issue of rivalry. The Western world will not leave us to just run on our own. We must know that we cannot depend on them to help us navigate this. 
nobody let go of where they are milking resources just like that. We will need to fight for it. We will need to fight for it by believing in ourselves. We will need to fight for it by supporting ourselves. We will need to fight for it by the choice of leaders that we put in place. We need to also fight for it by the quality of business that we do as businessmen, both locally and internationally. And the good news is that we have many good brands across Africa and the global scene today. So if we can elevate that standard and we are self-sufficient, at least for the start, then we'll begin to attract trusts. But if we cannot deal with that issue, you know, our ability to project the African nation as a competitive force will be, all they need to do is to call people and suggest a few things and they will come fighting. We must trust ourselves, we must support ourselves, and we must know that this issue of new colonialism must take a backstage. We can't do without, without collaboration, but that collaboration should be at the backstage and not in the front burner where it currently is. I, I just wanted to go through this route in, in, in speaking to this um, and supporting what Andre have said. Thank you very much, um, um, Blessing. We will we, we'll, we'll now you know, talk about Africa and the Sustainable Development Goals before we round up. Um, but, but adding to what you said, um, Blessing, what, one critical factor that Africa must overcome is the, the, the nature, you know, imbibing the nature of buying Africa. You know, uh, just like Professor Porter talked about uh, demand conditions being a very important component of national competitiveness, uh, Africans must imbibe that nature of buying Africa. That's, that's, that's the only way forward to lift over 30 million, uh, million people over the poverty line as envisaged by the Africa Complement of Free Trade um, Strategy. Now, um, the, the Sustainable Development Goals Center <laughs> forecasts that all African regions, except North Africa, uh, will likely miss uh, the attainment of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, now, I'll start with you, Blessing. What, must, what does Africa need to do short term mid-term and long-term to make sure that as a continent we are not left behind as far as attainment of the SDGs is concerned. Okay, thank you so much. So let me start from the comment you made, um, the fact that we must buy Africa. I think that's where it starts from. For us to buy Africa, we must elevate African products, the quality and standard of African products. I am a full supporter and a believer on that maxim that we should buy Africa, but not when Africa is giving me trash. We have the capability to elevate what Africa produces, um, and, and we must elevate it. That's on one side. And two, we must elevate the standard of living of Africans. So we have about 1.3 billion people in Africa. The question is, what actually is the commercial value of the 1.3 billion people? All right. Um, do we really, can we boast of 10% of that, which is just 130 million, as, you know, a viable market in terms of purchasing power? Th these are the things. So in the short term, we must have to come up with a plan you know, a sustainability plan. Because what we have now is short-term profitability because of mineral resources, because of grants and other things that we have. But these are not all sustainable. And, and the pandemic showed that many of the things that we celebrate because we are able to just keep body and soul going, they are not sustainable in the medium term and the long term. So first of all, is to come up with a plan, a strategic plan, you know, for education, for inclusivity, you know, and, and that we have to do with how do we treat women, all right? How do we treat children, all right? Um, what do we look at education in the north, education in the south, education in the west? Every African child, every African person should be valued as such. There should be no second-class African and first-class African. Everyone, there should be a basic necessity. Of course, we have 
the capitalists that will always be there in every region. But there are basic things. Food, clothing, shelter, waste disposal. All right? How do we deal with this? So for me, that's the first thing. We can't solve this overnight, but with a plan in the short term. A plan, a sustainable plan that is inclusive. Everybody buys into that plan and it becomes a workable plan. If we don't have this, I will support and believe those that are saying we cannot meet it because we have been doing a lot of talking and we have a lot of strategy, but we don't have commitment to those strategy. Can we make a, a document? Can we de deliver a document that every political class, irrespective of party, irrespective of tenor, they will subscribe to those plans to ensure that we progress? In the medium term, we must ensure that we begin to ensure the education of people and the registration, clear registration of people and support the less privileged, all right? Ensure that we support families that have their children going to farm at very tender age, selling their wares outside. So if we want them to go to school, we must have a way of supporting the parents, you know, in the medium term so that they can allow those children to go to school. All right, the women that are there working, we must ensure that we put a minimum wage, you know, both within the government and outside the government circle, that people must earn living wage. So if you go outside this country, people work all kinds of menial jobs, but there's a minimum wage, and that minimum wage provides a minimum standard for people. All right, and then the issue of, you know, power, waste disposal, and water, these are quite critical. You will be surprised if you go to some regions in Africa. It's an ice or it's a mess, you know, when it comes to how they dispose their waste, their access to water, and of course to power. And of course, on the on the long term, is to ensure that our investments, especially in infrastructure, whether through collaboration or government champion, must be such that we can, you know, um, both defend and be accountable for, both on the short term and medium term. And finally, I will say, maybe finally again, the second time, I will say, therefore, that um, as we go out as Africans to, to borrow money or bring money from outside, we must be careful to be sure that we are not selling our birthright and the future. And that is the issue of sustainability. The future of the younger generations, you know, mortgaging it for short-term gains. I will stop there now. Thank you very much, blessing. Um, Andre, could you want? Did you, would you want to add to that? Yeah, the uh, the hundred percent, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased that it's uh, blessing. What 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 he said? It's 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 serious. It's it's yeah. It's it, it's great if you can only add and maybe uh, well, one 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 item to summarize. Uh, there is a big debate about the minimum not minimum wage, but the uh, so-called social payment or minimum or wa wage which will be paid irrespective. It's a debate in Europe. I think this debate is actually not, not exactly correct. Again, in my opinion, my, my humble opinion. Uh, what Blessing mentioned, it's, uh, I think it's in many people's mind and Africa can pioneer that uh, considering we're limited resources, but at the same time, not everything costs as much as in some other countries. Yeah. So it's are all... About, it's are, all you, are, you it's about, are you talking about universal basic income? Yes, I'm not talking about exactly that. Yeah, but I don't like the idea of universal basic income. To me, what 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 should be established and it should be agreed, and it's whether it's country by country or for the whole continent. That's obviously different. That's politicians; they need to go and resolve it. Yeah, but what should be established is a minimum standards, and those minimum standards should take into account where we want to see, and that's exactly where it will be reflected, where we all, through the politicians. Yeah, we like them, we don't like them, but they are like representative who are empowered to pronounce the words which we are putting in their minds yeah or supposed to hopefully they will at some stage where we want to see and from this minimum standards that's how you are ensuring that resources those ones which are available are going into where we want to be as all nations living on this continent 1.3 billion uh, people yeah and population fast growing and to me where, why i i'm saying so uh, also what's encouraging uh, is that we Living in Africa, I learned well, I've, I've, I've traveled a lot in Africa and I've been living here for only 11, 12 years now. Uh, it was a big lesson that uh, capitalism could be different as well. And Africa has a chance to build that capitalism in a very, very different manner. 
because there are very good things about capitalism, there are ugly things about capitalism. And Africa doesn't need to repeat the ugly things. And last, last, which is the uh, Africa can build it in such a way, which will be again back to the blessing point uh, in a sustainable manner. Through again that minimum minimum package, I wouldn't even call it minimum uh, social team under which depending on the country, uh, they call it differently. Yeah, And that's to me altogether may maybe that that light in the tunnel i'm not suggesting the tunnel is completely dark not at all yeah but it definitely would be direction in that tunnel instead of at the moment going a little bit the part going back to the uh, in our initial point about the african union that may unite africa because that's that's common goal but again it's uh, it's in my very humble opinion with the limited knowledge of the african continent thank you Thank you, Andre. Andre, I just want to ask you a question uh, concerning ESG, uh, you know, the whole conversations around ESG. Uh, so, some, some, some quarters will say, you know, the whole philosophy of ESG is pretty much very defensive and, um, you know, really doesn't impact, um, you know, outside the walls of the company. It's more uh, organization focused. It doesn't impact society, you know, in, you know, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, could you just throw more light on that, you know, actually, you know, to our audience who really don't understand the philosophy behind this 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 new style of thinking? Well, if if I may, uh, uh, the uh, to me, the if you look at a little bit from the top down, yeah, uh, all what we're debating is sustainability. Uh, at, at sort of on, on the top, yeah, of the pyramid. So sustainability, uh, and, and there are lots of debates about the circular economy, but all part of the same. It's basically coming from the bigger concept of sustainable living, where we are not depleting limited resources. It doesn't matter that if, if somebody has millions of dollars or somebody has one dollar in the pocket, those people should have access, and again, to those basics, irrespective, no matter what. Yeah, that should be provided. Resources limited, we know it now. Yeah, whether it's space in Africa, we are very lucky, uh, very fortunate. We have uh, quite a bit of space. We have mineral resources, but in many parts of the world, uh, circumstances are much different and completely disastrous. Yeah, if you look at the oceans, the those uh, trash traveling from one end to another size of France. Yeah, that's that's complete disaster. You can't call it any way differently. Uh, but I'm not going there. It will take a long, long time. You know why we are where we are. Basically, we. Scientists said we will finish this world in the next 30, 40, 50 years. It will be done, finished. There might be some little colony of people living, but the rest will just be instinct because of the natural disasters. And they are happening. Because all Natal recently was flooded to the extent not seen for years, if not, if not tens of years. Yeah? Uh, over 300 people died. Thousands of people completely gone. The horses in India at the same time, there was uh, thousands of people and thousands of the places in fire because of the heat here is the flooding so it, it, it's it, it's not debatable anymore it's a good news so sustainable in but again I, I don't like when we're concentrating only on e which is ecology which is would be your uh, environmental factor or ecological factor how it was called in the past socially again i don't want to go there you open any newspaper and you see there how the whole world is boiling pot and again i'm not going back to europe now or afghanistan recently or france what's happening there every time elections are coming or in between elections across the globe that you can pick it or uh, movement recently in the united states a few a couple of years back all over the world yeah i'm not even mentioning south africa which is on its own boiling pot and many other countries so if we don't address that okay we will be living in a beautiful world in the everything green, everything cool, we will be eating sustainably, drinking sustainably, driving sustainably. But so what? Socially, we'll be fighting with each other and killing each other because that's where it's going at the moment. Yeah. And overall, you have a governance without good governance, or which leadership is a part of the good governance. Without good governance, all of these issues cannot be addressed at all. So what we're trying to do in, in our work and listening, please uh, join me if I'm missing something. Uh, in, other, in, in, in our work, day in, day out, we try to shed the light on the overall how particular companies are doing. Because it's everything starting, if you look at the economy, in those small, big, medium-sized enterprises called companies or corporates. Yeah? And from there, we obviously looking at the country-wide and continent-wide. But those 
little little or big ones, companies, corporates, those little bodies, they are, if you like, bricks of the good or bad way economy is going directionally. Yeah. But obviously, overall issue of sustainability is coming from much bigger perspective of society. And we are hoping that we are doing good job. And by doing good job in the one of the major part of the society, which is economy, uh, is a foundation for everything else, and the major polluter, unfortunately, and the major place where people are socializing, and the major place where people are behaving well, leadership is there or not there, or badly, as we all again learned over the last quite a few years, example after example, the governance is completely failing. Yeah, If we can fix it there, that will be already great news. That will spread. Yeah. So that's 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 where we are focusing, and we uh, in our work day day day, day to day, uh, we try to <clears throat> establish because again that's 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 proven over and over again that disclosure driving performance. We look at the companies how they're disclosing information related to ESG, and we're rating them, and we have a whole lot of other products which I'm not going to. It's not marketing pitch in any way, but basically we're saying based on what you're telling the world as well as news, as well as your financial performance, because sustainability cannot, if you're not making money, you're not sustainable, you will probably die as economic entity. Yeah, All together, putting it with a third view from the uh, newspapers, from your media in a good way, we understand sort of 3D financially, how you're doing, your shareholders liking, not liking what share price is doing. We look at the uh, what news agencies are telling about you and what you are reporting all together, we look at it and say, well, whether it's good or bad compared to others. And again, in the, I, I can talk for 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 long time. Apologize for taking so much. Blessing if I missed anything. <laughs> Thank you very much, Andre. Uh, we'll be taking the closing remarks now. Uh, we've, we've overshot our time you know, by just a little bit. Uh, so, so blessing your closing remarks. In summary, uh, you know, you, you've spoken a lot to the issues, uh, but in summary, what will be your, your final thoughts? Uh, to the Horasis global community and every other person going to be watching this video you know, many years from now. Okay, um, thank you once again, and thank you, Andre, for, for that on the ESG as well. Um, maybe I should just start from that ESG, just adding my bit to the fact that um, ESG is not about internal sustainability, it's actually global sustainability and your, your little contribution to that global sustainability where you are, you know, as an individual, as an organization. And if all of us um, look at these variables in, in, in details, in everything that we do, you know, we are looking at how it's affecting the environment, how it's affecting the social fabric, and how it's affecting the governance structure that we are building, then we build, you know, um, a sustainable future, especially for the young ones that are coming, who are very concerned and particular about the future we are living for them, all right, both on the social fabric and on the governance as well as um, the E. I will end up by saying that um, Africa is blessed, strategically positioned. Um, we are rich in resources, we are rich in people, um, and we have quality of people that can lead us to the very next future, whether technologically or in terms of the industrial revolution, whether fourth or fifth or the web two, web three um, phase that we are all um, entering at this moment. Um, but we need to be very pragmatic. We need to be deliberate. We need to be disciplined. We need to start trusting ourselves and knowing that we have the capability to lead the revolution, you know, in terms of industry and um, the, the empowerment of people. We have what it takes. Let everyone contribute in their little quota, but let us hold our leaders accountable and let us also be particular about the choice of leadership. And the last statement will be, let us trust you know, ourselves. We don't want to do business as just local champions, as individual champions globally. Let us support others. When we support, when we win together as a community, we are able to make greater and better impact. Thank you very much, Blessing. But before you go, I just want to ask this question. You are a player in the oil and gas field. Uh, Nigeria is, you're from Nigeria, obviously, and uh, Nigeria is going to an election year next year. Uh, the, the Minister of State for Petroleum, Tinukwe Silva, said that uh, Nigeria's gas reserves is worth 800 trillion US dollars. And uh, when, he, when, when I heard that, I was quite excited, but I, I looked at Nigeria going into the next elections, and I'm wondering, 
Um, how do we reconcile that 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 huge potential with the quality of leaders coming through? What 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 are your expectations? What 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 advice do you, would you give to the most popular black nation in Africa and in the world right now? I think we must be deliberate about the choice of leadership. We are we have vast resources, but 